Hello there! Well, we're really stoked to be bringing you this sculptural lesson because we'll be creating a beautiful shy horse with Montmartre polymer clay. But before we get into it, if you love art, then make sure you have a look at the other lessons at our webpage at www.montmart.net. We also have links to our Facebook and Instagram pages and our art club, The Creative Connection, and we'd love to meet you. So let's sculpt a shy draft horse. If one is committed to creating a realistic work, the movement and proportions must be absolutely exact. So a good set of reference drawings are a necessity. I have tried to be as meticulous as I can with these views because not only the general form is referenced from them, but also the armature's creation. For the armature, we'll be using 3 16 booker rods, a ruler and calipers, a wooden pallet for a plinth, tie wire, eight nuts and washers, a drill and one sixteenth drill bit, pliers and also some side cutters and a hacksaw that are not shown. First we need to make the armature. These pages are in the PDF that can be downloaded from the above link or at our web page. Step one is to bore the holes in the pallet or plinth. So centrally place the template on the pallet, tape it down and using a three sixteenth drill create the holes. Once the holes have been drilled, mark the aspect of the template to avoid confusion. Remove the template and we can move on to finishing the booker rod lengths of our armature. Start with the back legs and make the first bend. Mark the bend point with a piece of blue tack and use some flat nose pliers and slowly bend the rod to the desired shape. Keep checking it against the plan until it's right. Follow this process on all four legs and take your time. I will say at this point that a length of booker rod will not bend past 90 degrees as it will break so just bear this in mind. I have also found that booker rod that has maybe been lying in a hardware shop for years becomes brittle and inflexible so try to purchase new rods if you can and before you make the final cut screw the nuts on as removing them will recut the thread and make that final cut with a hacksaw. So the holes have been drilled in our wooden base pallet and the legs have been fashioned and cut to shape so now we can attach them. It is helpful to refer to the template to get the right rod in the correct hole. Place the nut on first followed by the washer. Place the rod through the base, thread on a washer, then screw on the other nut. Use a second pair of pliers to tighten. Follow this procedure for the other three lengths of rod. When all four rods are secured to the base, position them appropriately and tie the two sets together and then create the backbone length of the armature. Fashion the appropriate bend and then finish the length and tie it onto the legs. It is very important that this backbone length is tied in securely as it braces the whole armature. In fact, I can't stress enough the importance of building a strong armature as it enables you to be robust in sculpting and ensures the longevity of your sculpture. It is just as important for it to be accurate too. So take your time. This step may not be glamorous, but your sculpture's success hinges on this engineering foundation. Okay, well, once we're happy with the legs, we can create the head and neck part of the armature, bind that onto the body. So uh, let's get that made. It is easier to do long smooth bends with a long length and cut it with a hacksaw when the shape is right. For extra reassurance, you can use epoxy glue over the bound wire if you like. Okay then, well, our armature looks pretty good. The next stage is to pack our horse up with aluminium foil. We can then create a thin skin of polymer clay around it and do our first baking. So uh, let's get the aluminium foil in. The whole idea of creating a core is to ensure that a finite thickness of polymer clay is used. As well as offering a consistent layer of clay around the base, it is also a more economical way to sculpt. So clay wastage is minimized. 
make sure you compact the alfoil so there is no air in the voids and shrinkage from heat is minimised. Tie the bolts out shape onto the armature as tight as you can. Bulk out the head as well, but make sure not to add too much here. The worst thing that can happen is you add too much material and it limits your sculpting should you need to remove clay. So less is best. The next stage is to add the first foundation layer of clay. Ultimately, this should be a five mil thick layer. I'm using Montmartre Polymer Beige Clay in the 500 gram pack. Incidentally, two are required in a project this size. If you have a clay past the machine, use setting one and totally encapsulate the area. Keep the thickness consistent and as smooth as an egg. Overlap the clay strips slightly and blend them together. Ensure there is no pockets of air between the alfoil and the clay. The reason for this is that the air heats up and cannot escape and it fluctuates in temperature. Aluminium is very heat stable and cools quickly. Clay requires a smooth cooling transition to avoid spanding and or contraction. This expansion and contraction is what causes cracks. Add clay from the body and down the leg rods and smooth them out to a taper. But again, don't create too much bulk. I think that should do it. It's nice and smooth. The initial skin is on our sculpture and it doesn't really look like a horse yet but that's okay because there's a fair bit of visual information like bones and muscles that will go on it after our initial baking. So let's bake this and just follow the instructions. Once the model has cooled, condition your clay and bulk out the legs. Now Shire horses are a monstrous breed but their legs are still relatively slender. Pack on more clay than you need and then carve it away until the shape looks right. Keep turning the turntable so you can view the model at all angles. If you remove too much clay, you can just apply more over the area. Pack it tightly over the rods so there is no air voids. Incidentally, Booker rods make for a better armature than normal wire due to the threads supporting the clay. Sculpture is all about observation and a continuing refinement. If you keep at it, you will get it to a point that you're happy with. Use some calipers to get the accurate measurements of certain key points, like the bottom part of the back leg here. In fact, it's quite interesting, that lump on the back of the leg is called the calcaneum, and its distance to the plinth is the same length as the point from the back to the belly, and the distance from the summit of the withers to the sternum, and is also very close to the length of the head, so you can use all of these comparative measurements to ensure an accurate model. There is a diagram outlining these measurements in the PDF, by the way. Build up the glutes with clay and shape them with the modeling tool. I find it easiest to roll the tool over the surface to suggest a nice compound curve. If you are to create a sculpture like this, you will need a good range of modeling tools. You will work out soon enough what tool does what and it becomes second nature to pick the one that will give you the correct desired effect. As you sculpt your horse, you have to suggest many subtle elements, such as muscles and bones, and they all have to be in the right place or it doesn't look correct to the viewer. This is the wonderful challenge bestowed to the sculptor. I have found regardless of the viewer's expertise on horses, they generally know if it doesn't look right. So if you are to embark on a project like this, it is good to brush up on your anatomy. All horses have a large tendon from the calcaneum to the fetlock. Elements like this are better put in from a tube of clay smoothed in. The knees are a good example of how bones are evident beneath, and again the position must be correct. A shy horse, on average, weighs 850 to 1100 kilos. So you can well imagine they need to be very robust to support their body weight. As a matter of interest, they are also on average 17 hands tall. That's about 178 centimetres. The largest recorded horse in history was a shire fittingly named Mammoth, born in 1848 and he stood 219 centimetres high. Once the legs have been shaped, I add some clay to suggest the pectoral muscles and the biceps, 
I love this stage, it makes all the prior tedious work worthwhile. It's a good practice to lay these muscles in as they are on an actual horse's body and blend them in. This tends to look more convincing. I use a small pointed wooden tool to refine each muscle. I also use a stiff tacklon flat brush to smooth in any additions. Next I add the large deltoid muscles that wrap around from the sternum area up to the scapular shoulder blade region. On draft horses this is extremely pronounced. I blend it into the top of the foreleg and smooth it all off. I can then build up my friends latimus and deltoid muscles that extrude over the shoulder. With many years of hauling plows and farm work he's pretty shredded. In the 1500s draft horses were a valued war horse or heavy charger but by the mid 1600s the type was relegated to farm work as the cavalry favoured lighter faster mounts. At 1100 kilos the shoulder blaze would be quite apparent so I fashion an appropriate shape and apply it to the correct position. I also add clay onto the top of the neck. The shire's neck is slightly arched and long in proportion to the body. I add clay to suggest the mastoid muscles on the front of the neck and then lay a skin over the top portion of the body and smoothly blend this into the hindquarters so no transition is apparent. Once the body is done I follow the same process with the neck. The Shire horse has an enormous capacity for pulling weight. In 1924 at a British exhibition a pair of horses were estimated to have pulled a starting load equal to 45 tonnes and they were apparently working in slippery footing. The term Shire was first used in the mid 17th century although the breed's roots go way back. I refine that neck shape bearing in mind not to remove too much clay. Remember it is easier to remove clay than to have to reapply it. I use a ribbon tool to remove more clay to define the mastoid muscles. I can then start on my friend's head. The head of the Shire is long and lean for its relative proportions. They have very large eyes with a large muzzle and a predominant chin. To suggest all of this information we need a good amount of clay to push and pull around. So lay a thick sheet over the head and ensure there is no pockets of air between this layer. Let's listen to some music while I sculpt the head.
that's all the main elements in. I really hope that you're enjoying the movie. Now we can move on to the mane, the tail, and that beautiful feathering around most draft horse's feet. So let's get that on. Traditionally, many draft horses had their tails and manes braided to keep them out of the way and to look beautiful, of course. So for the tail, I'm creating a simple plait. As well as looking impressive, from a sculptural point of view, it's also easier. Once the individual hairs have been suggested, cut it into three equal proportions and then create the plait. I like to create elements like this on a sheet of perspex because it adheres to it slightly and doesn't move around too much. Once the plait is created, it's a simple job of applying it onto the horse. One thing to bear in mind is that the tail extends from the backbone, so it is situated higher than one might think. Next I create the braided mane. This braid is created with a series of rosettes. Once this is fashioned, press it onto the neck and cut it to size. The mane starts behind the eyes and extends to the withers. That's the lump above the shoulders. Then use the spike tool to join it. Remember you're suggesting hair emitting from his neck. Then use that spike tool to suggest the hair leading to each rosette. Finally, we can create the feet and the feathers that are synonymous to most draft horses. First, shape the hooves and smooth them in. Ensure the angle is correct. Then wrap a sheet around the lower portion of the leg. Cut it to size, then suggest the individual hairs emitting out at the appropriate angles with a hobby knife. Once this is done, you can reposition it back onto the leg and blend it in. It will be necessary to redefine the fur with the spike tool as a lot of that suggested fur will be flattened out and lost. Incidentally, there is no logical reason as to why shires have feathered feet from my research. They offer no protection and next to no heat is lost from the hooves. They are apparently just born like that. It's just another example of their wonderful uniqueness. If you want to go even further, you can add more feathers to really highlight this intriguing element on your shire. Well, thanks for tuning in and remember to always keep on creating. See you next time.